Welcome, everyone. My name is Greg Ball, and I'm the Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences here at the University of Maryland. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this afternoon's portion of Social Justice Day. We are pleased and honored to have as our plenary speaker, Reverend Jesse Jackson, who has been a beacon and a leader in the area of social justice in our country for decades. It is entirely appropriate that we welcome him back to the University of Maryland to give remarks on this special day uh, to talk with us. This introduction will be made by one of our wonderful students <clears throat> uh, here in uh, the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, Ashley Vasquez, who is a sociology major, who has emerged as a student leader both on the Senate and student government and in the, her uh, sorority and the Greek uh, system in general. So I'd like to ask Ashley to come to the stage to do the introduction for Reverend Jackson. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing? Today, I'm honored to introduce a great hero of mine who will bring our Social Justice Day to a close. But before I do that, I want to share my thoughts on the day. As a graduating senior, I enjoy reflecting on my time here at Maryland, and Social Justice Day gave me the opportunity to do just that. So throughout the day, I asked myself a simple question. If I could go back and think about one word over the last four years to explain my time here at Maryland, what would it be? And I thought about it, but the answer was simple, activism. During my teen years, social issues were very prevalent in my community, but they weren't answered. There was no action taken. So when I arrived at College Park, my eyes were open to the injustices going on, not only in my own community, but around the world. So the answer was clear again. I had to act. Because regardless of any sounding pressure, I acted because silence is complacency. I came to the conclusion that we all have a choice to make. And, to, and in action in itself, would illustrate my tolerance for injustice. Yet, in all of my action, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the strides of people who came before me. Trailblazers, pioneers, groundbreaking men and women who would forever change our history. Yet, there's one certain reverend, Reverend Jesse Jackson, who comes to mind when I think about social justice and change. Hailing from South Carolina, Reverend Jackson is a trailblazer who pushed for empower empowerment movement, peace, civil rights, gender equality, and economic and social justice. Reverend Jackson's activism started when he was just a young age of 19 years old. He and seven, uh, him and seven others entered the whites-only public library in Greenville, South Carolina to protest the systems that kept them out of the library. They were arrested and jailed. Shortly two months later, their activism proved successful when the library abandoned their segregation system. Shortly after that, around this time, the Reverend was also offered an opportunity to play in the Major League Baseball with the Chicago White Sox or pursue his football career at the University of Illinois. He shortly began his studies at the University of Illinois on a football scholarship, but later transferred to North Carolina A&T State University and he graduated in 1964. Shortly after his graduation from A&T, Reverend Jackson started working with Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Him and Dr. King worked on the civil rights movement, and he was with Dr. King when he marched in Selma, and many of us know that he was with Dr. King in Memphis, Tennessee, when a cruel assassin bullet tragically ended the life of Dr. King in 1968. Dr. King's life ended, but Reverend Jackson's activism and commitment pushed forward. It only grew stronger. Reverend Jackson went on to found Operation Push, People United to Serve Humanity in 1971, and the Rainbow Coalition in 1984. Even with his impressive record of service and activism, Reverend Jackson knew there was still more work to be done. So he decided to do it through the electoral process and public service. In 1984, he became only the second African-American man to run for president on a momentous and widespread campaign. Although he was not elected, he won many votes and influenced the Democratic Party's platform and many national conversations. And in 1988, 
he ran again, gathering many votes and continuing to pioneer the party's change and influence many national conversations. He continued to push for office, gaining the shadow Senate seat for the Dist District of Columbia from 1991 to 1997. And in 2000, he was awarded the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Clinton for his long life work in activism and service for social justice. An icon for human rights, a trailblazer for equality and justice, and an American hero. And given that I'm a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Reverend Jackson is my fraternity brother, <laughs> and Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, please join me in welcoming the eminent Reverend Jesse Jackson. Deltas have a way. Let me express my sincere thanks for your kind and generous introduction, for the invitation to be with you today, to be graced by the presence of your president. Mr. President, please stand. Give him a big hand, please. I want to talk today with you, share with you, engage in some Q&A with you about the revolution of values, a call to a higher ground. I was here, unfortunately, my last time in this chapel was when Lynn Bias, a great athlete who meant so much to all of us, died overnight, and we did the service in this chapel. And from that day to this day, it says something about his life and death, the cheapening of it that means so much to this generation. American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, who said, man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. Man's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds a house, they that labor, labor in vain. This week we commemorate 50 years since Dr. King was assassinated, 100 years since Mandela's birth date, the recent transition of Winnie Mandela, who made her transition two weeks ago. I was in South Africa with that family until last Thursday. She was the cornerstone of the South African Democratic Revolution. Also on April 4th, the same day Dr. King was assassinated, at 6 p.m. that day, Linda Brown, along with Thurgood Marshall, laid the cornerstone of American democracy and made her transition on April the 4th. While we're celebrating Dr. King's commitment to democracy, his commitment to multicultural coexistence using faith to end unjust racist laws, war on poverty, ending the Vietnam War, ending violence, we are a poor, we post-genocide Native American, post-slavery of African Americans at our foundation a foundation that was built on moral sand which subjects always to shake and quicken of our foundation. African Americans, 1619, next year, 400 years later. There's a temptation to focus on events to personalities which have played huge roles in this journey. We owe it to ourselves to put some focus on the journey, not just on the events. The book of Matthew, the first chapter, traces David to Jesus, 142 generations, a thousand years. Jesus spoke fluently of Moses, who was 2,000 years older than David. One well, of the factors on our journey is that our memory has been substantially erased. Too often our spirits are broken, just we do not often use all of our best on this journey. For example, the four million blacks in slave states that are unregistered today. Two and a half million registered who didn't vote are victims of voter suppression two years ago. 
For me in high school seniors who should come across the stage dismayed with a diploma in one hand and with a card in the other. And millions of college students who do not use the laws of residency to vote where they actually attend school does limit themselves from the leverage of their vote. Millions of Native Americans from Florida to Alabama to Mississippi to Oklahoma to Seattle already here when Columbus came closer. He was lost on the way here. He used his authority to claim them and thus it was said he discovered them when he actually found them. Those who subsequently came as immigrants, indentured servants, refugees, or slaves traded and sold from both sides of the Atlantic. It's a unique category. Some came as immigrants, some as indentured servants, some as refugees. But some came on slave ships. America's first international trade, the foundation of America's wealth, resources and, and labor, shipping industry. More valuable than its land, insurance companies and banks was the slave trade which lasted 246 years. Paraded and sold from seashores of West Africa to seashores of Eastern America. This is the uniqueness of the African American journey because a color amidst white racist supremacy that was no way to integrate. At best, abolition and desegregation were the only response. We survived under white supremacy. Marginalization, the laws of segregation, even the day unending racial discrimination. The four stages and five critical laws that must be become part of a conversation like this one. 1619, 1863, legal slavery, 246 years. Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. 1865, two years later, 13th Amendment. If Lincoln had not signed the Emancipation Proclamation, if Africans should not have joined the Union Army, there would not have been a 13th Amendment. His freeing those that he could free was an impact upon, guess what, determining that the Union won the war and slavery was ended, as a matter of fact, laying the groundwork for the 13th Amendment. In 1877, Tilden Hayes compromised the betrayal of the promise. 1896, the Supreme Court made apartheid official, Plessis versus Ferguson. 1954, reversal on 1896 Brown v. Board of Education. Or 246 years of legal slavery, when it ended, we were 246 years behind in every facet of life. Education, banking, engineering, international trade, politics. The short period of Reconstruction, which has lasted to this day, was halted due to the betrayal. HBCUs and given some land and some licenses on the segregation. Just as in South Africa today, we gain freedom without equality of equality or reconstruction. Freedom without equality or reconstruction. Today in America, as in South Africa, we have freedom without equality. This leaves us at the end of the third stage. That was slavery, stage one. Jim Crow, stage two. The right to vote, stage three. But you can have all of those and starve to death without the fourth stage access to capital industry, technology, and deal flow. Thus, you cannot find a downtown building in America from Baltimore to Atlanta, Memphis, Chicago, Denver, L.A., New York, building owned by African Americans because of denial of lending and credit. In 1954, the Supreme Court decision ending Jim Crow, the right to vote established by Thurgood Marshall and Linda Brown, I lived with Rosa Parks and Dr. King emerged in 1955. I asked Mrs. Parks, when I asked Mrs. Parks, why? Then you go to the back of the bus. You could have been hurt, run over, locked up, beaten, killed. She said, I thought about going back. I thought about Emmett Till, who had been lynched, and I couldn't go back. But for six months, we had been considering testing the 54th Supreme Court decision. Rosa Parks' journey was a reaction to testing the fruitful decision of Linda Brown and Thurgood Marshall, Dr. King, was a result of her testing that case. We should never start at 55. 54 was a legal shift in the culture. 
So the King 63 speech made in the context of legal Jim Crow. The day he made that speech, I was there as a student, proudly just left jail from Texas across to Florida up to Maryland. We couldn't use a single public toilet. We couldn't buy ice cream at Howard Johnson. We couldn't rent a room at Holiday Inn. Our money was counterfeited. The day he gave that speech, black and Latino soldiers had to sit behind knots of peeled devil on American military bases. The day he gave that speech, a year before the Civil Rights Bill, two years before the right to vote. It had been a constitutional right to vote. Gore would have won in 2000, but they wanted states to determine the winner. Voting is not a constitutional right, it's a state's right. In 2016, Hillary Clinton won by three million votes. The Electoral College is, is, is as offensive as the Confederate statue. The Confederate statue. States' rights, electoral college are all a part of the same dynamic of concession to the South in that war. The winner and the one person won vote democracy, you cannot lose with a three million vote plurality. Hillary Clinton won the election on democratic terms and uh, it was presented to Trump on non democratic terms. It's important that we reclaim and lighten up the dark past of our race memory and revise our will to fight back. We do our best to fill up put rooms and streets and jail cells and voting booths. We go from the balcony in Memphis where Dr. King was slain to the balcony of the White House where Obama was inaugurated. The 40 years of wilderness from Memphis to the White House, we never stopped fighting. We never stopped marching, voting, building coalitions, using our main weapons, revolutionary values. When Rodney King was beaten in California, he was the victim, not the hero. The hero was a guy, a white guy named George Halliday, who filmed it, took it public. He could have said, it's not my business. The black guy was in the wrong neighborhood. All the police couldn't be wrong. I'm not going to get in trouble. But the white guy, George Halliday, was the hero. Ronald King was the victim. Beyond color and culture, some call character the higher value. The recent event in Starbucks where two black men were violated, a young white woman named Melissa filmed it. They would not have been believed. A young white woman filmed it and the manager was fired. It went viral. The whole corporation was shaken beyond color culture. There's something called character. People know that you care, care that you know. But they want to really know that you care. There's a biblical story when a man posed a question of Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus answered with the seeds of revolution of values built on the parable. A Jewish man was beaten, robbed, left to die. He looked up and saw a uh, a rabbi, a reverend, a minister, a man of God coming his way. He felt relief. After all, this was his ethnic and religious kin. The Bible says he went to the other side of the street and kept walking. Is that your neighbor? And then the Levite, a man of his own ethnic group, his soul brother, saw him lying there, crossed the street, didn't want to get blood on his clothes. Another man of a different religion, different race, spoke a different language, worshiped God differently. The Samaritan helped him and put him on his way. Beyond calling culture's character, these values which Dr. King embodied in allowing an unarmed man without a political position, without a gun to transform America in a fund fundamental way. You who are here at Maryland today have an unusual opportunity to learn, to labor, to love, to live, to build, to grow, we survived apart. We must now learn to live together. Low animals survive apart. We are a multicultural, global world. Half of all human beings are Asian, half of them are Chinese. One eighth of the human race is African, one fourth of those are Nigerian. Two thirds of our neighbors speak Spanish. English is a minority language in our hemisphere. 
Who would want to build a wall between us and two-thirds of our neighbors who are our number three trading base, except one who can't count or can't think? Most people in the world today are yellow, brown, black, non-Christian, poor, a female young, and don't speak English. The reason I chose to deal with the issue there of, of value is not just some of Dr. King's acts. Because if you don't put what Dr. King did in a historical context, you kind of miss the point. He was a scholar. Dr. King finished high school at 15, finished college at 19, seminary at 22, and PhD at 26. You can't teach what you don't know. Can't leave where you don't go. Mandela was a lawyer. Oliver Tumble was a trained lawyer who had the option to pursue private materialism. They chose social revolution. Castro was a PhD three times. This was mild. Those who lead must learn, and, and, and those who learn must lead and must care with values that lift us above our situation, our circumstance. Today we stand on solid ground of change and hope. America is a great nation. May it great about its service and its caring for people whose backs are against the wall. I am concerned today that, that all that we've gained is under attack. The Voting Rights Act is under attack today. Public education is under attack today. Environmental laws are under attack uh, today. Uh, a sense of nuclear threat is seems imminent with madness in high places in the hands of men who are power drunk and drunk with power. And yet somehow it is our hope that will sustain us through this very difficult season. Don't let them break your spirit. You keep marching. And you keep voting. You keep standing tall. It's not enough to be registered to vote uh, and you in, you're in College Park if you live in New York. You're not going home just to vote. You should vote where you live. Vote where you have, where you get your mail. Vote there and make something happen. Dr. King, I remember the last three staff meetings we had with him. On January 15th, it was his last birthday. We didn't know it would be his last birthday. Uh, on that birthday, we, uh, he came to the office around 10 o'clock, blue jeans on, the windbreaker jacket. And, um, we convened about 60 of us, some whites from Appalachia and the Smoky Mountains, some blacks from deep south Georgia, Alabama, and the Delta, some Native Americans, some Jewish allies from New York, some Latino Americans, some of, some of the group of Chavez out southwest, and that we met how to end poverty, a war on poverty, a war on poverty. Poverty has a way of restricting you. It's like a six feet person in a three foot bend. You cannot stand tall. You begin to think poor, act poor, believe poor, eat poor, live poor with poor dreams and limitations. So let a man stand. So he said there should be a floor beneath which no one loses access to health care or formal education. We spent that morning on how to end the war, how to fight the war on poverty. Around noon times, the owner Clayton brought in a cake. The doctor forgot it was your birthday. And we stopped, we ate the cake, drank the punch. Then that afternoon, the focus on how to end the war in Vietnam. He felt the war in Vietnam, that bombs dropped in Vietnam would explode in our cities because the money is needed for social uplift was being used to kill. We killed three million people in Vietnam alone. Uh, and, we, and, and we expect to be forgiven as if we did the right thing. We sing proudly and boastfully God bless America. Every now and then we should ask America, we should, America should bless God by doing the right thing, by doing justice, by being fair, by loving, by caring, uh, by sacrificing. Uh, but the last that meeting which made was the most painful was he called me about 10 o'clock on a Friday night and said, meet me in Atlanta tomorrow morning. I really didn't want to go because I had this mission, another assignment up here in Chicago. So Bevel and I, we got up and caught a seven o'clock plane to Atlanta. They sat and said, uh, the nine of us, he said, uh, I've had a migraine headache for three days. My wife, Coretta, Rapper's wife, Juanita, and then his wife, 
we've sat together and for about three days and uh, maybe I've done as much as I can do in 13 years. We won the Montgomery battle. We won the Birmingham battle. We have the right to vote. We're about to get fair housing. Uh, we had the war on poverty. I'm not going to bifurcate my sense of justice between the war in Vietnam and war on poverty at home. Miranda Young said, Dr. King, don't talk that way. He said, well, Andy, let me speak. Don't say peace, peace when there is no peace. He was under severe attack. He chose to fight the bigger issue beyond color and culture to character. And he was under attack by other African-American leaders, under attack by the media, under attack by the federal government, who had gotten permission to tap his house phone and car phone uh, and office phone and hotel rooms, paying maids money to see if there was seam on his sheets, trying to disgrace him. Uh, we went to Memphis, he was about 55% in, in the negative among blacks, and 75% in the negative among whites. He died hated, though he was a lover. Died, non died violent, though he was nonviolent. And so he said, let me talk. He said, well, maybe I should uh, starve or fast to the point of death that uh, my friends with whom we have strategic disagreements but we're fundamentally friends will come to my bedside and we will sit together and revive our struggle, rap Brown and Sophie Carmichael and Roy Wilkins and, and the like. He said, but then you know, we, we're, going, we're going on to Memphis to fight for the garbage workers. He said, matter of fact, they're not garbage, they're sanitation workers. He said, the fact is, if they don't clean up the streets, the doctors can't perform surgery. They don't clean up the streets, teachers can't teach, you can't breathe the hot air in Memphis and Mississippi River. We can talk about the value of sanitation workers. They too want to take a bath and on Sunday morning and go to church and watch their children graduate from school one day. He's talking about the higher value of sanitation workers. We went on to Memphis. And then that afternoon, around five o'clock, we were to we were to have a, go out to Reverend Billy Kyle's home for dinner. And he said, I'll be ready in about an hour. So I came out across the yard and he said, uh, Jesse, you have, don't have on a shirt and tie and we're going to Reverend Kyle's home for dinner and you don't even have on a tie. I said, Dr. King, prerequisite for eating is an appetite, not a tie. He said, you're crazy. And we laughed and he went, bent over to speak to Ben Branch and he said, play my precious Lord song. Pow, he hit him. And he was dead in the instant of the shot. But my friend, even death cannot stop the struggle. Death can become a stimulus. From the balcony in Memphis, Tennessee, to the balcony of the White House, 40 years later, one would not believe it. There was a sense of something within that says we can make it with or without. Don't give up, don't surrender, don't stop studying, don't stop trying, don't stop loving. Believe in yourself and believe in your friend. Do, do not self-destruct through drugs and alcohol. It may be short-term pleasure, but it's long-term pain. Don't self-degrade. Move on to higher ground. When you get there, hold your hope. There is a struggle today for the soul of America between going forward by hope and healing or backwards by hurt and hate. We must win the battle to go forward by hope and healing, not backwards by hurt and hate. This land is our land. God bless you and keep up alive. May I ask you a question? Please sit, be seated. How, how many of you are registered to vote? You're not registered. Raise your hand. You're not registered. Who's not registered? I, I, I know you're embarrassed. If you're registered to vote, are you registered to vote in College Park? Raise your hand. You know, one of the, the dimensions of the Voting Rights Act, you really must hear this. If you've got 25 or 30,000 students on this campus, if you vote where you live, you impact the politics of College Park and Maryland. 
If you're here from New York, from Philadelphia, from Atlanta, wherever you're from, you're not going all the way home just to vote on that day. It is like not having the vote if you don't apply that principle. Residency matters in the voting process. I was in Alabama about, oh, about a month ago, University of Alabama, about 3,000 people packed in the room. All were registered, but only about the tenth of them were registered in Tuscaloosa. They could celebrate the victory in Alabama, but they had nothing to do with it. We, we need, as we come into this fall, every student who lives in College Park should be registered to vote in College Park and register to vote where it's accessible to your own student center, as the case may be. Every high school senior should come across the state with a diploma in one hand, a vote card in the other. And, the, and maybe the big secret is that there's a whole body of people who really cannot read and write so very well. And uh, they are ashamed to admit it. When I ran for the presidency, my grandmother was not going to vote for me because she couldn't read and write. She didn't want to mark an X and be made ashamed. My mother had to almost take her downtown bodily. But everybody who votes has the right to have a companion in the booth. Everybody who votes has the right to have someone in the booth with you. Those principles allow you, in fact, to College Park and set the pace for the whole of Maryland and the Southeast. And I look forward to engaging in conversation with you right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Reverend Jackson will take questions. Uh, we have two microphones uh, set up where we would uh, encourage you to uh, come. You want to go ahead over. Uh, Why don't you just state your name and then ask the question. Reverend Jackson, it's an absolute honor to get to hear you speak. Thank you, first and foremost. Uh, second, I wonder if you could speak to how we could use faith, especially Christianity, to speak back to those who have captured it for oppression and uh, anti-egalitarian purposes in our country. Those who use faith to hate and divide, that's like fake news. <laughs> <laughs> the classic definition is faith is the substance of things, the hope for evidence un unseen. What is your substance? Your substance must be love or it's a misguided missile. Your substance must be feed the hungry. That's the mission statement. Clothe the naked, set the captive free. Declare this is the year of the Lord. That is the substance of faith. Uh, sometimes I get the impression that many of the evangelists use uh, evangelism as a, as a label, not as a substance even of piety and immorality. It is a contradiction for them to be as, use piety as a, as a weapon to beat people with and embrace Trump in absolute terms. That's a contradiction in terms. But the evangelism of them is not, it's, it's not spread in love, it's spread in fear, manipulation. Don't let them sell false faith. False, real faith is born, Jesus born poor, born under a death warrant, goes to Egypt as an immigrant or a refugee, come back preaching for the poor, set the captive free, sacrificed his life for others and died in the process, that is, that's not exactly quilling and dealing in political, political rhetoric. Yes, ma'am. You must have some on your mind when you move. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you very, very much for being here again, Reverend Jackson. It's quite an honor uh, to just be in the same room as you, but just to, to hear you speak as well. Thank you. Um, my question revolves around Donald Trump becoming president. It has shed light on many concerns. Um, for me, I think it's shed light on a lot of underrepresented and underrepresented and uh, minority groups, and I'm wondering, I, as you were talking, I was looking at 
everybody who's here, there's people of all ages and races. What can people my age do to overcome some of these concerns? People who are 14 can't vote yet. <laughs> I'm 22. <laughs> First of all, he did not win the Democratic election. I mean, if those who protested <laughs> the, Confederate, the Confederate flag and Jefferson Davis and states' rights, controlling education and labor and voting, is beneath the principle of the constitutional right to vote. You can't win by three million and lose. He's not legitimately the elected president of the country, A. Therefore, we, we cannot ignore any longer the, the, the price we pay for the hangover of Confederate laws. Secondly, uh, Al Gore, within five, got Bush was in 534 votes in the, in the front. This, the state stopped the count with 27,000 votes in the ballot count uncounted. Really, Gore won the election. I do not understand why Democrats would not fight to end state law controlling the constitutional right at that time, and certainly Hillary in, in 2016. Having said that, he is now considered the, the president, and what a disgrace he is. In the sense that uh, presidents have some obligation to convene the family, a one big tent family. The notion that President Barack was not born in America was always a, he, he knew better, but manipulation. The idea that in Charlottesville, Charlotte, uh, Heather Hyde was killed, showed no mercy, uh, and he, he equated the, the Nazis with people marching for peace and freedom, uh, unraveled the uh, Paris Accords on climate change, which Puerto Rico is paying a big price for even today as we speak today. You got literally people here to state from France and Germany coming today to beg our president, please be civilized. It, it, it's painful and disgraceful. But the good news about our democracy is that, that there are enough check and balances to at least slow him down. So the impact on the, the, this, he would just wipe out immigrants real fast. But the court process is slowing that down. The war on refugees, that's slowing that down. There have been some elections in the meantime. We won the election in, in Virginia uh, with the black, uh, black byproduct being a black lieutenant governor. We won the election in New Jersey. One election in Philadelphia. We can win the elections in 2018. That's the opportunity. <laughs> but if you are eligible to register and vote, school and college, you cannot go home to vote that day. If you have an exam, you are aiding and abetting the process. No one has the right to do less than their best. When you go home this summer, you should change your registration to where you get your mail. Or wherever you stay the last two or three nights in a row is where you live. <laughs> say wherever. <laughs> say wherever. Repeat, say wherever. I stayed the last two or three nights in a row is where I live. Vote there. Um, so I'm saying that the good news about our democracy is that the check have slowed the process down. The, the tendencies of the present administration are rather fascist, but in a difficult situation, we'll hold on to, to November, I believe it. In, in the meantime, four million blacks in the South are unregistered. We're going to work real diligently on them, on them this summer and fall. The two and a half million who didn't vote the last time, we're working real hard on that. We're going to get high school seniors in May and June to register and vote. Uh, because there are more 17 and 18 year olds than there are 71 and 81 year olds. So those who've been marching from Parkman High School in Florida, if they will turn that energy in the voters, they cease being those children to become just constituents real fast. So we have the power to fight back and we should use it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so you and then we'll go over there. So go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is revolving around, um, you, you spoke to Dr. King's work at the end, uh, towards the end of his life uh, on the war on poverty, and he brought together 
groups of people who may not have worked together in, in another setting. Um, and I think one of the issues we have today is, is folks don't know how to communicate with each other anymore, uh, particularly if you have a difference of opinion, um, even when the end goal uh, is the same. So my, thought, my question is, what are your strategies uh, that you can recommend for bringing folks who might be of different backgrounds, have different beliefs, uh, but can work together towards a common good? It's interesting how the football team, you know, is black, white, and brown, but what really matters is red and white. You play in Clemson, orange and white. Uh, you, 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 you measure your, you cannot win unless you choose uniform color over skin color. You can't win unless you choose direction over complexion. You have to learn to live together and, and give up some sweat and some blood. Uh, why do we do so well on the basketball court? Multiracial, multicultural. See the last night, the kid from uh, uh, Rubio from from Utah. Uh, it's Latino in Westbrook, L.A. Uh, with Oklahoma, and another young man, African American from Greece. Uh, repeats it whenever. Repeat, whenever, whenever. Whenever. whenever the playing field is even and the rules are public and the goals are clear, the referee is fair, the score is transparent, we can win. Now, if you had to deal with the privileges factor, in, on, you couldn't play ball together. If blacks had to run 12 yards for a first down, because they came from a broken home, and whites had to run seven yards because they came from a two-parent household, you couldn't have a game. And so learning, learning how to have fair rules is a big deal. And it starts with your classmate. It starts with eating with somebody that you don't know at lunchtime. It, start, it starts with meaning to relate to someone who is Asian or Latino. It starts with learning another language. Uh, most people in the world are yellow or brown. Like English is the minority language in the world. Really, at this stage of the game, if you can only speak English, you're really handicapped. Two thirds of my neighbors speak Spanish. Anybody that can learn both sides of the Debra Jacket rap album can learn another language. <laughs> or two. All I'm saying is that, that you got, when Dr. King said us down, we, we meant to learn to work with Appalachian. I'm, I'm, I'm alarmed at how many white Democrats run a campaign in Ohio and never go to Appalachia. There are 33 counties in, Appal in Ohio and Appalachia. Lyndon Johnson, when he opened the war on poverty, he went to Appalachia. If he had gone to Harlem at that time, and the war on, they did well as he's trying to appeal to the coloreds, trying to appeal to Adam Power. He went straight to Appalachia. He whitened the face of poverty. And, and, and democratize the debate. Most poor people are not black. They're white, they're female and young. Whether white, black, or brown, hunger hurts. You must care that they hurt. You can't pass somebody on a, on a wreck on the highway and say, let me see, are they white or black? You're inhumane. You've you got to go beyond the limits of color and culture. That's why I mentioned the case of Rodney King. He's out in the Rodney King I don't know how many universities gave George Halliday an honorary degree. He was a hero. Rodney King didn't mean to get beat. <laughs> the, the young men who got stopped at, what is it? Uh, up in Philadelphia. The store. The blank. The two young men got at the uh, Starbucks. Starbucks. You would not have known unless a, a young white lady filmed and took it from you. When the four young police, when the four police were set free, hill, and uh, a white driver, Reginald, then drove to the ghetto, four blacks saved him from them. Our capacity to go beyond the limitations of our box, colors our box, cultures our box. Character takes us to, to another level. People who are trained and who care must go beyond the limits of the box we've been assigned to. 
I will not accept the box I've been assigned to. Next. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Trey Huff. Uh, so since the 50s and 60s, we know a lot has changed, like technologically, a lot of legislature has been passed. Um, however, we still see this, a lot of similar problems uh, that you all dealt with. Um, as far as student activism goes, what do you feel like the role of student activism, what, do, what role do you feel like that plays in today's social, uh, social movements? And uh, do you feel that, well, what method of protesting do you feel is the most effective in today's society? Like, should we still keep doing the same marching and sit-ins that we, we saw in the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement, or should we change things? First get that alpha jacket off. <laughs> Nah. <laughs> I apologize. Dr. King was caught up in the alpha stuff, so I'll give you guys a break. You know, some values are changeless in changing times. Water quenching thirst doesn't get old. So there's no new kind of water, for real. They can charge you more if it's the same water. Uh, boating still works. Four million blacks in the South unregistered. You know what happened in the Alabama race? You did something that was old and fundamental. We outboated them. We outcoalesced them. We won. When Barack Obama, an African American, was name like Barack Hussein Obama wins twice. When we got the right vote in 1965. Blacks have been denied the right vote for 85 years. I went to conserve on juries. They were locked out too. 18 year olds couldn't vote, those serving in Vietnam. You couldn't vote bilingually. You couldn't vote on college campuses. When you look at it, you look at the, the blacks plus the Latinos plus the women, that's the new majority. We, out, we outworked them and we beat them. So that still works. Voting still works. Learning still works. If someone on the campus today, whatever configuration he or she has, a race they have, if they have the cure for cancer, there's going to be a long line outside their door. That's why, that's why strong minds break strong chains. That still works. Helping people besides yourself, it's still values, the reason I reverence values still matter. And so, uh, I, I, what does not work, threatening and shooting each other doesn't work. Killing in Nashville last night didn't work. I, I, he, no, he wanted some change. Uh, the, 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 the truck driving into the people in, in Toronto today, that didn't work. Violence doesn't work. Among other things, violence is not redemptive. There, there no, there's no winning in violence. There's no redemption in it. So, yes, I think that m marching, when the students marched in, in Florida, uh, as opposed to tearing up their school, they marched down the roads. They got legislative change within a day. Mass, nonviolent, direct. Don't, don't, don't let anyone tell you that mass, direct violence, mass, direct action is impotent. What's impotent is when you, when you set yourself up you bring him a dead shot at your back by throwing a rock, and he can shoot a bullet. So yeah, I, I see a thing voting matters, and I would make, make the case today, I would ask every, well, again, please, if, if you're a registered voter, raise your hand. Raise your hand real high. you registered vote in, the, in, in, the, in College Park, raise your hand. That's an issue. It's right, right in your, that's an issue, because I tell you, if you live in maybe Baltimore, but say Philadelphia, or New, New, New Jersey, you're not going all the way home just to vote for somebody. You can pull for somebody, but you can pull a lever for them. Right, guys? You hear what I'm saying? You know what, what, what 30,000 votes mean in, in Maryland? If, you, if, if, you, if your issue is reducing student loan debt, if your issue is, is free public education, and we can't afford free public education, Bernie Sanders is right. It's a matter of what's important. We can't afford free public education. 
In the markets, we can fight, but even, even say even, say, say repeat even. even. You don't agree. The free public education it's is affordable. We have the right to vote for it. And to not vote for it is to, is to accept tuition rising uh, while the, the cost of living gap is getting greater. Just left South Africa Wednesday night. I was over there for a week when Winnie Mandela died on this women's dimension of it. We knew about Winnie Mandela before Nelson Mandela. She freed him, he didn't free her. When he was in jail, we hadn't seen his face for 27 years, I heard his voice. The Mandela heart was beating, but it was Winnie's heart, not his heart. That's that part of it. The second part of it is that in, those 20, in that 27 year struggle in, in, in South Africa, we, we, got, we, ended, we, ended, we ended race apartheid, we didn't end resource apartheid. There was, there was a horizontal gap based on race, that's closed. The vertical gap based upon resources, that gap has gotten wider, got, gotten longer. And so we, we have, a, we have a, the next phase of our struggle today is the resource gap. Ra racially, we can come in a place like this together, date together, have big fun together, go to ball game together. When it comes to who can afford to pay their bills or not, the reason that that's the struggle of our time. Say access, capital, industry, technology, deal flow. Struggle of our time. If you in fact spend more than you have and vote less than you have, that's suicide. If I spend more than I have and vote less than I have, that's just, if I spend less than I have and vote all I can, I'm moving up the, up the, uh, uh, up, up the road. Those are, those are fundamental basic values. Those values are not changing in changing times, in my judgment. Yes, sir. Thank you, Reverend. Um, my name is Alan Weirdak. I'm a senior history major. I was wondering if you could comment on corporate taxation, especially in light of the new tax bill that was passed by the GOP recently. Um, my comment is, I guess, or question, what do you think should be the role of the state if they have any role in corporate taxation? And um, in light of that, what do you think that the working class can do to kind of combat this corporate taxation? To me, what was sinful about that was to take away money from the poor who need health care, the one percent need the extra money. It's like a, a, a sinful, greedy, it was a greedy shift. And that's why if, if Democrats win in 2018, they must change that. They can't just say it was a bad thing and leave it as it is. Winning must mean reversing the reversal. How do we do that? If, if, if winning does not mean changing that, then winning has no value. And so too few have too much, and too many have virtually nothing. And, 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 and instigating the trade war will not resolve that. We can negotiate trade bills of the fair without demeaning people. We can, we can modify our relationship with Canada and, uh, and, uh, and Mexico without assuming that the, we have all the cards. Suppose we were to really anger Mexico and they saw us as the enemy and they live next door. We have no defense against Mexico. 2,000 miles of border that we share. That's, that's irrational. Suppose we were to really anger, anger Canadian, Mexicans, uh, Canadians, anti american We actually need the Canadians. We need South, Central, Latin Americans. We need them. They're, they're not back door, they're next door. And only the arrogance which think that way. We, must, we, we, don't, we do not have all the cards. But when a good card game is not even fair unless you share the cards. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Kiki. I'm a journalism major. And first, I want to thank you for speaking tonight. Um, I know we talked a lot about voting today. And I actually have family members, for whatever reason, decide that they don't want to vote. And I try to talk to them to convince them that this is a right you should exercise. But I can't seem to get through. How do you? think I should go about that, or how do I communicate how important it is to go out and vote? Only registered voters can serve on juries, for starters. Voters will determine 
uh, whether your street lights are fixed or not. <laughs> And so, if you vote by your enemy, you decide not to vote, you've allied with your enemy. It doesn't even make sense. The fact of the matter is, you vote when you don't vote. That's the reason when Trump said, those who didn't vote against me. Those who don't vote, vote. So they must know that the, the arithmetic of politics is of such, they cannot avoid making decisions. They don't make a decision it seems to me, but they must make a decision and live with the consequence of their choice, which may not be a perfect choice, it may be their only choice. They must vote. I like talking, where, 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 where are you from? I'm from Bowie, Maryland, so I live 15 minutes away. Well, let's, let's talk this so over. You're from Bowie, okay. I understand that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh. Hi, my name is Howard Anthony. I'm a senior public health science major. It's an honor to meet you. I have two questions. So first question, so can I get a picture afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> oh, go right now, girl, go! <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. Oh my gosh, ah. I'm so nervous. Number two. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you gonna, you wanna she has a question. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, you can, um, okay. Um, okay. But yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, okay. I wanted to ask for advice. I'm a, okay. Let's say that you weren't graduating. Well, let's say that your college doesn't let you walk across the stage, but then other colleges on campus let their students walk across the stage if they have like four credits remaining. So would you still walk in graduation? Well, never mind. I think I'm wording my, my question wrong. Okay. You, 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 you're trying, you should honor your credits, right? Huh? You should honor your credits to walk, right? I have the credits, the necessary credits, but my college doesn't let students walk who doesn't fulfill all the requirements, but <laughs> other colleges on campus let their students walk if they have four credits remaining. That's in the a protest. Time. The president's sitting right here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a sitting movement to me. Hmm? Okay, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> I was so glad to graduate eventually. I didn't matter what the deal was. Just let me get my piece of paper. Let me swing it in there. Hi, my name is Claudia. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of English. Um, truly an honor to hear you, to meet you even at a distance. Uh, just thank you so. <laughs> thank you. So is you said this great line that I quoted during your speech, or that I wrote down during your speech, those who lead must learn and those who learn must lead. Um, and I was just wondering, what do you feel like those of us who want to lead and get involved in social justice, what do you think that we need to learn? I suppose learn the difference between piety and public policy. To be a good person is pious and appropriate. But being a good person, Rosa Parks was a good person. The sign above the driver's head read colored seat from the rear, the white seat from the front. So until she changed the public policy, a year of protesting, a good person went to jail. So good people must fight for good policy. And, and many people are, are, are very much into being good people, but they will, good, good, being a good person does not require sacrifice. It's very, it's very private, very personal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But policy, that's what involves legislation, litigation, registration, and fighting, and marching, and protesting. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you, your PhD is in English? Yes, sir. Teach your president how to speak. <laughs> 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 so, 
since you appear here, what, what does what does big, what does big big bigly mean? <laughs> <laughs> Bigly. <laughs> Bigly. <laughs> okay. We're going to make huge change. A huge, a huge change. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, my, my point is that you, you cannot affect public policy unless you, you cannot affect it by yourself. Rosa Parks only mattered that it triggered the boycott. And that only mattered that the law stood up the year. That's why I, 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 it will be kind of quick today, but we just kind of start with Rosa Parks and Dr. King. Mm -hmm. But the suit that Lyndon Johnson, who was nine years old, triggered, mm -hmm. Rosa Parks was 42. Mm -hmm. Thurgood Marshall was the backbone of it. Dr. King was the spokesman, the articulator. Uh, but, but until the law, say, say, we, we, say we live in our faith, we live under the law. No matter how much faith we had, mm, no until, until the law changed, slavery, slavery remained. Whatever. No matter how good we were as a person, mm, no how until, the until the law changed, under segregation. segregation. People of faith must fight for just law. That's fighting for public policy. And so, when you go to the bank, but she said, well, Jesse, I tell you, I thought my name but also, I, we tested the law. The boycott, the one mm -hmm. at the Montgomery. Mm -hmm. But the Supreme Court ruled that the boycott was appropriate. We won bus riding everywhere. The Thurgood Marshall and the Brown, Martin King, Rosa Parks, we must never forget them. We, Rosa Parks and, and Dr. King. But Linda Brown, who, as it were, was, her funeral was on last third, April 4th at 6 o'clock, the night of the celebration. I, I was trying to get to a funeral in uh, Topeka, Kansas. My family didn't realize it was April 4th. They would have had the funeral the next day. That's uh, ironic, ironic. But we, we go on the wing, say, when the law change, people of faith have a victory. If you have faith, you have faith. Without, legal without legal protection, without legal protection, nothing changed. Nothing changed. Man, those in jail twenty six years. Until, when the law changed, you could, you could, you could vote. The guy. Mm -hmm. Question one, one two. Okay. Yeah, well, these are the last two. So May. Reverend Jackson, it's truly an honor to listen to you. In 1968. You, Reverend Jackson, Dr. King, Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy, we're talking about social justice. We're talking about serving the poor. We're talking about equality. In 2018, 50 years later, we have somebody living in the White House who equates those who march for peace with the Nazis and the white supremacists. My question to you is, did America lose its soul? What happened? The loser won, as one thing happened. Secondly, we have not changed. The right wing has seized the government. We must fight for the soul of America. That's a contest between those who we're going to go far by hope and those who are going to go backwards by fear. And so, uh, in a, if you're robbed, don't concede to the robber. Fight to get your resources back. And I'm saying part, part of what, if, if, if Trump forces, if they had their right, Jeff, Jeff, Attorney General Jefferson, uh, said the Voting Rights Act of 65 was infringement upon voting rights. He's against the Voting Rights Act of 65. That, that's who he is. But we, can, we can protect ourselves if we, in, in 2018 if we fight back. Mm -hmm. Now, if we, if, we, if, we can, if we concede and surrender, we can't win. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we won in 2000 and did not fight the state's rights. We, we have not really fought for the constitutional rights, but we have the state's right to vote. Every state has its own set of laws. 
50 separate state and unequal voting rights. We need one uniform voting rights code for American voters. Yeah. Secondly, the, uh, we fight for public Let health. Let us repeat, we won. Ask us to repeat it. We won. Oh, yeah, we he won. lost. <laughs> yeah, we won, they lost. Come on, yes. we won. We won, <laughs> he lost. Okay. If I had won by 3,000 votes, I wouldn't have conceded that night trying, trying, trying to look American. I'd have fought like a alley cat. Mm -hmm. If one person went for democracy, if Maryland beats Clemson by one point or by three, you can't explain why you lost because mm. it was raining or something. If you won, you won. Yeah. The, I, it's incomprehensible to me that that was not a vigorous fight in the face of winning by three million and, and then accepting losing. And we act as if that, was, that, that could happen again. Yeah. Now, b before we get to the, to the Russian factor, we don't know, quite know what the Russian factor is. We do know the, uh, the scheme of um, uh, the scheme they use of uh, the, 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 the states' rights scheme and the uh, what scheme they use on Hillary? You're all asleep. <laughs> The, uh, the, they won the four states on what basis? Electoral College. I'm, yes. I wake up here. <laughs> but my point is this Electoral College, even Trump, in some of his Twitterization, says it's, it is rigged it, 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 because it's, it's, it's Confederate and it should not be. Last one, yes, sir. Uh, Reverend Jackson, uh, I voted for you twice, and I hope, <laughs> I hope, I, I know you have some health issues, but I hope you run for president in 2020. I just, I'd love, I'd love to see that happen. I know you got the fire and you got the, the presence to really make a big difference in the world, and you continue to do it. I have a question about, I'm a, I'm a scientist, and I'm a biologist, and truth is an endangered species right now in this country. And I, I have a question for you about the role of education in making a difference, and I'll tell you why. I mean, the people you're talking about who don't register to vote, many of them are confused by the news, or don't think that their vote will make any difference. So you look at the psychology of why they don't vote. Some of it's institutional racism. You talk about that. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that they've lost faith in the democratic process. So my question for you is, how do you change that? How do you turn that around? I mean, we're in a university setting here, but you know, I think education begins maybe most powerfully earlier in life. Uh, and I wonder what you've thought about in terms of how you train the next generation to respect truth, to actually you know, think on their own and you know, make a difference. So I, it's my question for you is, I, I'm not sure that it really, it's going to be easy to turn this country around, but I think a good place to begin is respecting truth, coming up with ways of thinking, you know, about facts in a way that doesn't mean that when everyone speaks truth to power, or someone yells, fake news. Well, that's someone. They, they're fake. The, 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 the climate change agreement in France was correct. Trump's uh, disconnection from it is incorrect. We must. That is the, the, the truth. Is that when the when you melt the ozone layer and the sun hits the, the ice mode directly and it melts and the waters rise and temperature rise, you have more Puerto Ricans and people who live along Houston and the coast are trapped. With that is truth, scientifically empirically proven. And, and the like it's just another rainstorm is a lie. It's un we, we cannot concede the truth we have learned for the foolishness that we are being taught. And, and that's why I mean it's a struggle for the soul of America, a struggle between science and superstition. It's a struggle. Yeah. Some people really, really do think that, 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 that hate is, is the ultimate winner. Some believe that love is, is the winner. I believe love is the winner. Sometimes hate seems to rule. Dr. King was a, Nonviolent man got killed by violence. Man of love got killed by hate. 
I still believe it. He would, if he were here today, would tell you the same thing. So that they, and, and so I asked, I went to a high school oh, about a month ago, 753 seniors, half of them were Latino, fighting for DACA. And I asked the principal, let's register all of them to vote. But we have a, we have a, a our class is in, involved in our exams there. 753 votes for DACA? And you're talking about an, another priority? That does not make sense. Every high school senior should come across, because they've been, say, students do what they're taught. They, 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 they sing songs, make a banner, they pledge allegiance, because they're taught. They've been, they're not been taught, but they're not uh, apathetic. They're ignorant of, of power. Um, and so that's, that's a teaching process. As I said, sharing with the president some, some of our officials tonight, if, if an African American comes to the University of Maryland and, and is faced with racism, do you test that person's ability? Is there, are there any classes on the on the on on, on anti-racism? Are we taught how not to be racist on, on campus? Are we, are we taught how not to be? Learn it at home, right? Learn in church. Learn in mass media. We're taught how to be race supremacists. At what point do we unlearn a bad lesson learned well? The book some years ago called, I guess it was called Black Man Bring the White Man Chain. The problem is today that these people are ashamed of being racist. Now there's a shamelessness factor in racism, as if racism is something to be bragged about. When we were coming up in the Dr. King era, we were called Southern segregationist racists. They were Jefferson Davis slave segregation secessionist Democrats. When they shifted and became Reagan and Goldwater Republicans, they ceased to be racist and became conservatives. They are no more racists. Y'all follow me? They, they rebranded. <laughs> because the, nothing changed but, but, but their brand. The same people who needed Social Security and call it communism, needs, they need Social Security. Can you imagine somebody in, in Kentucky, poorest county in America, is in Kentucky, and they're voting for Trump because they, they did not want Obamacare. They wanted affordable health care. <laughs> they want an um, but didn't want the egg. Right on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. President Lowe, could uh, you make, like to call you up to make concluding remarks for this event, President Lowe? And, uh, thank you. Reverend Jackson, it's been almost 30 years since you were last here. You were here for the memorial service of land bias. And I hope your next visit to the campus will not be in 30 years. You'll come back sooner. We would love to have you back. Um, just to hear you talk, to be in your presence as one of the moral giants of our generation was has been for me today a very moving experience in two respects. You talked about voting, but beyond what one can do, there is also in you 
and in the civil rights leaders of the Martin Luther King era, a profound trust in American democracy. That's what I sensed. I say this because earlier this fall, Congressman John Lewis said right where you were, and he talked about his experiences about trying to, about leading demonstrations, being beaten up because he was trying to advocate for the passage of the Voting Rights Act. He sacrificed, he almost got killed so that young people have the right to vote. And yet, like you, I'm deeply troubled that millennials who constitute 33% of the electorate, less than one half, voted in the last presidential election. But then on the other hand, on the other hand, there is a deep commitment, I sense, a deep faith that even though America is not where it ought to be, you will not be doing what you're doing. Martin Luther King will not have done what he did without fundamentally a belief that America can be. And I'm reminded of the words of the Harlem Renaissance poet Langston Hughes who said, America was never America to me, but this I swear, one day America will be. And it's because of people like you, Martin Luther King, John Lewis, and so many other people that we're making at least small progress, small steps towards progress, towards fulfilling the ideals of this country. So Reverend Jackson, thank you for all that you've done in your life to enable America to be what it professes to be. Thank you so much. <laughs> and now I'd like to give you Thank you. Thank you. B by the way, June 12th through 16th, the Rainbow Push International Convention in Chicago. You may go to our website, www.rainbowpush.org. We are going to have a vigorous, vibrant voter drive this fall. We're also going to affirm people's belief in themselves and their country and in democracy with massive voter participation. If you would like to come to that convention, I, I would like to have some terrapins <laughs> at the convention. Thank you very much. This concludes our event. Thank you all so much for coming.